let me begin by um, saying that we are, of course, living through an unprecedented ecological and social crisis with inequalities rising, planetary boundaries that are being crossed. Every year we eat up more planets. Uh, we are consuming about 1.6 planets each year today, and competition for resources is increasing, not only oil, as was the case in the past, but also Earth's um, land, water. We have entered into the Anthropocene and the description of Paul Crutzen, which is a period during which um, the problem is not only biophysical, it's also social because of the impact we have on the environment that we inhabit. So that the transition towards sustainable societies poses complex social ecological problems. Now, given this situation, there are three possible attitudes I think we can take. One is very simply um, wishful ignorance. Denial. And uh, Paul Verhage, um, Harald Welzer, as social psychologists, uh, are aware of the work that Kahan and others have done, showing that we have great difficulties to process information that obliges us to question our lifestyles. Information that is disturbing. Information that questions our identity. And that we prefer to repress, to ignore, because it is questioning whom we are and how we act. Inconvenient truths, as in the title of the film of Al Gore, um, are those truths that we hear but do not act upon. Um, this is what Kahane and Al call uh, the white male syndrome, um, meaning by this that those who dominate power in our societies, those who have the wealth and the power, have no interest in changing, and it's not more information about the crisis that is impeding that will change their way of doing things. So wishful ignorance is a convenient position, but of course not a solution. The second solution is politics as usual. That means making responsible choices as voters, as consumers, but um, just voting and just consuming more responsibly presents four risks. First, there's a risk of losing the race against time. There is a huge time lag between the signals that we give as voters and as consumers and the responses provided by the political system and the markets. Secondly, there is a risk of this being ineffective um, because the signals we send are ambiguous, they are mixed, they can be easily reinterpreted and de-radicalized by those in positions of power. Thirdly, there is a risk of failure because of the many lock-ins in the dominant systems, the path dependencies, the sunk investments, the routines, the lobbies who are so good at protecting their vested interests, the spirit of competition that, as Paul Verhage has shown, the neoliberal system has in instilled into us as effectively as if we had been through brain surgery the golden cage of endless rat races envisaged by Max Weber a century ago. And finally, just being voters and consumers means that a huge potential is being lost, the potential of social innovation that is untapped. The single most important limiting factor, in my view, of, um, for the transformation is the lack of political imagination, the lack of audacity in daring to imagine something else. And so there is a third attitude. These are exemplified by the 100 transition initiatives in Ghent that Michel Bowens was referring to. People doing things, creating vegetable gardens, launching community-supported agricultural schemes, sharing cars, exchanging clothes, working within the collaborative economy that is envisioned by Michel Bowens. This, I believe, is important and promising for three reasons. First, it is the kind of attitude that can be robust across time, because when people enter into these initiatives, when they make their own systems, they do so not because they are forced to do so, not because regulations impose on them to do so, not because taxes discourage 
antisocial behavior. They do this because they are motivated in doing so, because this corresponds to values they have and believe in, and they cherish these values enough so that they continue to invest in those modes of collaborating with one another, even when this is not in their immediate um, interests. And social psychologists uh, working on the self-determination theory, such as Edward Dickey and Richard Ryan, show how this is an important motivational factor. What people believe in, which values they adhere to, um, what, um, they, what image of themselves they want to have and to, and to preserve. This is important because the more people do these things, the more social norms change. And we know from various studies that once 17, 18% of the population adopts a different attitude towards smoking, for example, towards using cars, towards uh, dumping waste rather than recycling it, 17, 18% of the population changes their behavior. This has trickled down effects across whole of society. Secondly, these social innovations are the source of social diversity. The diversity of lifestyles obliging each individual to ask about him or herself. What am I responsible for? Each individual must rethink his her position in the system. The dominance of one single system, one single set of values today, the values of a work-centered society obsessed with material consumption and growth, even at the expense of happiness and well-being, that dominance of one system is de-responsibilizing and it is disempowering. Harald Welser is right to note that normal people can be drawn into committing atrocities if they have simply no um, room to think what they actually want, which values they actually cherish. Instead, with social diversity, with this multiplication of social innovations, we have each individual experiencing him or herself as an agent of change, as having to make choices that will be deeply political because it is a vote between the different systems that one can choose from. Alternative lifestyles are a condition for us to choose, a condition for us to become autonomous agents, as described in the very inspiring work of Dirk Holemans. Social diversity, I believe, is a condition for autonomy, just like autonomy is a condition for the ecological transition. Autonomy, Harald Welser tells us, is a social creation. Third, these social innovations allow to recreate social links, to ensure social integration, a condition both for the individual well-being and for public health. We know from various studies that actually the single most important factor that reduces life expectancy is the lack of social integration, the lack of social links. More important even than tobacco consumption, than excessive alcohol consumption, or than obesity. For such social innovations to prosper, including those shaping the new sharing collaborative economy, we need a new view of politics. We need politics as unusual. Without abandoning the role of the state as a guarantor of the public interests and the um, redistributor of wealth to ensure basic equality, we need a state that sees itself differently, that is more modest, that learns from citizens' innovations. A state that creates space for people to reinvent themselves and to reconnect to one another. A state that is not thinking for people, but thinking with them. For this, we need, I believe, a new kind of wisdom, and, and the word wisdom came forth in our discussions at the beginning, after the very inspiring presentation by Harald Welzer. This is not the wisdom of experts. It's not the wisdom of technocrats. It is the wisdom of this um, legendary um, African woman who was known to be very wise. And there was this child wanting to prove her wrong. And this child went to this woman with a, a bird in his hands, and the bird was alive. And the children asked the woman, is the bird alive or is the bird dead? And of course, 
If the, women, if the woman had answered, well, the bird is alive, the, children, the child would have killed the bird, squeezing the bird in his hands, and the woman would have been proven wrong. If instead the woman had been saying, well, the bird is dead, the child would have released the bird, and the woman would have been proven wrong. Well, the answer of this woman was, my child, the answer to your question is in your hands. Thank you.